He said, you foolish Galatians. Now, I've never been that bold to get up and say, uh, point to my congregation and say, you're a bunch of fools. I don't know, man, this guy is bold, all right? But, but he's calling them fools, and, and uh, there's a reason for this. Then he, he follows that up with, he calls them that, and then he says, who has bewitched you? Now, I know some of you aren't old enough to remember the program Bewitched, all right? But, but most of you, I think, are old enough. Remember Bewitched? Uh, I've tried all week to wiggle my nose. It wouldn't work. But she would wiggle her nose, and a spell would be cast, right? And the whole idea here is, who has cast a spell on you to move you away from the gospel that you received? I love encountering new believers because new believers have such a wonderful faith in God. Uh, they haven't been messed up yet by the old-timer believers uh, who, who uh, you know, have gotten just uh, accustomed to their faith and begun to take it for granted. Everything is new and fresh and exciting. Like, man, did you see this Bible verse? I think i got to memorize this. This is a good one. Uh, and, and the older Christians said, oh, yeah, I memorized that a long time ago. But he said, who bewitched you? Who deceived you? Who cast a spell on you? Who, who's tricked you? And so that you're not as fervent in your faith and the doctrine of grace and grace alone. Who has put their spell on you? And I think this introduces a series of things that he says, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. He says, don't be fooled about the crucifixion. Before your very eyes, who's who, who has bewitched you? Don't be so foolish. Who's bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly per portrayed as crucified. Now, I got the portrait there, hanging on the wall, a picture of Jesus on the cross. And, and when we think of portraying Jesus as crucified, I think we immediately think of something like that. Uh, you know, a little statue icon or a figure, a picture on the wall. Paul's not talking about that kind of stuff. He's not going through the details. He's not talking about, oh, hey, you know there was a death squad of five to eight guys, and one of the Romans guys, he, gave the, he was a centurion, he gave the orders and the commands, and one guy sat on his arm, the other guy picked up the nail, and he pounded in his hands, and, and then the other guy was on his legs, and another one was pounding at his feet, and they lifted him. He doesn't go, I don't think he's talking about that kind of stuff at all. They lived when it was a common sight to see a crucified slave, to see a crucified person. They knew the brutality. They knew the, that this was a means of execution. And he's saying here, before your eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. He's not talking about the physical details. I think he's talking about Isaiah 53. That his soul would be made an offering for sin. I think he's, uh, like he says in, Roman, or in first, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him to be sin for us. The one who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He was crucified for our sins. He's saying here, wait a minute. Don't be fooled about the crucifixion. Jesus died for you. That's how he starts the book, for the first, first uh, two, two verses of the book. Christ died for our sins. That's what he's talking about. Hey, who's, who's bewitched you and tricked you uh, to water down the gospel? He took your guilt. It, this is not just about being a goody two-shoes, holy guy, a really nice person. It's about confessing your sins that Jesus died and took your place. He is your Savior and Lord. Don't be fooled, he said, about the Spirit either. I, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit of God by observing the law? Do you receive the Holy Spirit by being a rule keeper? By keeping the Ten Commandments, the golden rule, is that how you receive the Holy Spirit? 
And you know the answer, because we've already covered this in the book. No! I don't receive the Holy Spirit. But he says, or by believing in what you heard. Oh, there's the answer, the yes. When you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you receive Christ. And if anyone has not the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. So the moment you belong to Christ, you receive the Spirit of Christ. You have the Holy Spirit. And he says you, you get the Spirit by believing, not by following a bunch of rules and regulations. Don't be fooled, he goes on and say, says, uh, about the Christian life. Are you so foolish, he asks, after beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human efforts? Are you trying to keep a bunch of rules? Do you think the Christian life is about what you do? You do this, you do this, you, do, you don't do that. You don't smoke, you don't drink, you don't play cards, you don't go to the movies, and you don't go out with any girls who do, right? And all you do is you read your Bible all day and you meditate and you twiddle your thumbs and you, you pray all day and, and uh, you, you never miss a Sunday. So these are the things you do. He says, do you really think that's the Christian life? It's not about rules. It's not about your energy. It's not about your effort. It's all about God's grace reaching down into your heart and your life, changing you from the inside out so you just don't want to do the things you used to do because you just want to do the things God wants you to do. There is a regeneration and a transformation that takes place from within. We talked about this and we showed on the screen how I used to have a former life and now I got my new life. My former life was a caterpillar life. And then I met Jesus. I went into this cocoon and I came out the other side a beautiful butterfly. I don't do the things a caterpillar does. Creepy, crawly, eating leaves. Man, now I fly. You see, what, you see what he's saying? It's not by human effort. It's by the transforming grace of God in your life, changing you from the inside out. Don't be fooled about what the Christian life's about. It's not about a bunch of doing a bunch of rules and regulations. Don't be fooled about the purpose of life either. He said, listen, have you suffered so much for nothing? Obviously, Paul, when he had preached in, in the Galatia, area of Galatia, they had even stoned him and they left him for dead. And, and, and it was a pretty violent place. Apparently from this passage, the things they did to Paul, they turned around and did to the believers there too. He says, you suffered so much. He said, was that really for nothing? Was it just a black hole that took in everything? That life doesn't matter. He said, or, or was it? If it was really for nothing, he said, no, I don't think it was for nothing. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. Nothing in your life is for nothing. Everything in your life has a divine assigned purpose. You said, you mean, uh, Pastor, when you're driving down the road at 2 o'clock in the morning on 275 and, and all of a sudden in the headlights you saw a deer and you didn't get out of the way in time and you smack dab hit that thing and put $3,000 damage on your car, that had a purpose? Yep. What was the purpose? It must have been that deer's time. I don't know. <laughs> but God has a purpose and a plan for every one of us. We have the past that we have so he could show the grace that he has so that we could change from the caterpillar into the butterfly. There is nothing in our lives that is for nothing. Everything has a purpose. Everything, everything, everything has a purpose. Don't be fooled. And then he says, don't be fooled about the reason. Does God give you his spirit and work miracles? The word miracles here is dunamis. Dunamis, we get the word dynamite. I mean, this is stuff like the power of dynamite. It is, it is power. God does powerful things. I don't think there's anything more powerful in the whole universe than the work of the Holy Spirit regenerating and changing a person from a caterpillar into a butterfly. Changing what I used to be into what I am now. But he's talking here about the miraculous power of God. He said, does... Does God give you his spirit and work 
miracles among you because you keep the law? You keep a bunch of rules? Or because you believe what you heard? I guess the question is here is what is God honoring? Is he honoring your efforts by keeping a bunch of rules or is he honoring your faith? And the answer is he honors your faith. Sometimes something bad will happen to us, like I hit a deer 2 o'clock in the morning driving down the uh, interstate. And, you know, my wife's asleep, and she jolts out and said, Did you fall asleep? <laughs> you know? And, and, and it's all happening for a purpose. And sometimes we then ask ourselves, What did I do wrong that God did that to me? Ever been there? That's this whole thing of keeping the rules. Oh, I must have broke a rule, so God is zapping me. That's not what this passage is teaching. God is not out to get you. Now, I don't, you got to get that out of your head. I don't know where that came from. But that's what the Judaizers were trying to put on the Christians. God will only bless you if you do good things. The Bible is saying God is gracious to you even when you do bad things. Isn't that wonderful, though? There is nothing I can do good enough to earn the grace of God. So the moment you get this idea, this notion that, oh, God must have been punishing me for what I did, and God is gracious. Oh, of course there are consequences. Yeah, I did have to pay the deductible. I did have to take the car in. I had, those were all consequences of my having the accident. But there was no punishment. God was gracious and allowed me to live. My airbag could have gone off and smacked me in the face and destroyed my life. But God was gracious. The reason, he says here, God, did God give you the spirit and work miracles among you because you keep rules? Does he bless you because you keep rules? Or because you believe what you heard? He turns a corner at the next verse and says, now let me show you what I'm talking about. Consider Abraham. That's what the text says. Consider Abraham. First of all, he says, consider Abraham's faith. Now, he picks on Abraham because Abraham lived about a thousand years before there were laws, the rules, the regulations, the Ten Commandments. Or if you were Maimonides, who uh, read them all and counted them all up, there's 613 commandments in the Torah. 613 ways in which you can mess up. And we probably mess up on a lot of them every single day. He lived before that, and it says, listen, now consider Abraham. He believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. God put it on his account to be right with God. It wasn't what he did. It's what he believed. It's what he believed. Now understand then that those who are believers, those believe, who believe, uh, that would be you and me if we believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior from our sins. Our children of Abraham. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When I was eight years old and I was a little Gentile guy and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, God didn't all of a sudden make me a Jewish boy. So being a child of Abraham here is not saying all of a sudden biologically I changed. What it is saying, I'm a child of Abraham because I express the same faith Abraham expressed way back then, so that makes me a follower in the steps of Abraham. He's the father, I'm the son, and this whole thing called faith. I believed. And if he believed and God counted that to him for righteousness, why would I think it's any different? I believe and he counts that to me for righteousness. So I don't have to keep a bunch of rules and regulations. I just believe in Jesus and I love Jesus. And if I love Jesus with all my heart, I'll do what is right without somebody telling me what I got to do. Why? Because I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Then he goes on and says, listen, the scripture foresaw that God would justify a Gentile boy like me in the year 1960 by faith and announced that gospel in advance to Abraham, 2500 B.C. Whoa! He announced, here's what he said, all nations will be blessed through you. Not just the Jews, 
All nations, Gentiles will be blessed through you. Now, this is the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 12 that he's quoting from. And God says, I'm going to make you a great name, a great man, a great, great nation. I'm going to bless those that bless you. I'm going to curse those that curse you. And there's a whole bunch of things in there. And then he adds, and through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. We know that was through him that the Messiah Jesus came. And through him that Messiah Jesus extends the gospel to all nations so that anyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter who you are, you are blessed. And so what he says here, so those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. God is out to bless me. You know, this changes your whole attitude in living. You love the Lord with all your heart, and you know that, man, if I love God, God is just going to bless me. He's not out to get me. He's out to bless me. I need to trust God more because the more I trust him, the more he's going to bless me. It's not the more rules and regulations I can put in my life. That doesn't work for anybody. Now he says, consider not only Abraham. Let's go to Moses because Moses is the law guy. He brought the law about. All who, who rely on keeping the rules and the regulations under the Torah, the law, are under a curse. Oh, wait a second. Abraham, I get a blessing. Following the rules with Moses, I get a curse. Yep. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. What Did he say everything? Come on, folks. Have you ever had a ham sandwich? If you've had a ham sandwich, you broke the law. You're cursed. That's just one of the 613 things, and we've probably done hundreds of them. <laughs> you're cursed. Oh, my goodness. Now you're going to ask one a little bit later. We're not going to deal with it this week, but the upcoming weeks. Then why in the world did God give the law? And God gave the law so you would find out you are a guilty sinner and you need a Savior. You need to not keep rules, but you need to believe in Jesus because salvation, being made right with God, comes by believing in Jesus, not trying to be a good person because you can't be good enough. You're under the curse. Then he goes to Habakkuk, Habakkuk the prophet. Now, we studied Habakkuk just uh, back in the spring, okay, Habakkuk the prophet. And uh, Habakkuk has this one fact that he pulls out, and it's repeated through the New Testament three times. Clearly, no one is made right with God, justified before God by the law. The law cannot make you right with God. All it can do is condemn you. You've got to be made right some other way. And here's what he says, because the righteous will live by faith. You believe, and you are justified. So we've got to recognize the difference between two things here, between the law and faith. The law is not based on faith. And he goes on to explain that. The law is not based on faith. The man who does these things, the law, keeps the commandments. He's a doer. He's got to live by them. You check those things off every day. You got to do those. There's a difference between the law and faith, and there's a difference between doing and believing. Doing and believing. Doing, I keep a bunch of rules. Believing, I just trust in God and what Jesus Christ has done. I put my faith in him. There's a difference between cursing and redeeming. And some of you have no idea what that S&H green stamp is up there for. How many know what an S&H green stamp redemption is? Oh, good, I got a good audience today. For those of you that did not raise your hands, back in the day, a long time ago in a galaxy far away called planet Earth. <laughs> you could get these little tiny green stamps when you made a purchase at certain retailers. Gas stations were notorious. They would put, you could get green stamps if you bought gas there, so you'd go there to get your gas so you get the green stamps. The green stamps were like money. You'd lick them and you'd stick them in a book, and when you got a full book of them, you could take them to the Redemption Center. And the Redemption Center was a store, but they didn't accept any money. All they accepted were green stamps. 
Green stamps were money in the store. And you went to the redemption center so you could redeem the stamps for a product of your choosing. Now, there were all kinds of things in the dream book. Anybody remember the dream book? It had all the products in it. And the car was like a million books of green stamps. <laughs> right? A big pen was like one book. <laughs> all right? And so you counted up your books, you took them in, and you used them like cash, and you bought. You redeemed what you wanted with the green stamps. The word redemption means to purchase, to buy. Christ purchased, he bought us, he redeemed us from the curse of the law. We all have broken the law, 613 commands by Moses. Listen, somewhere along the way, you've broken it, and he went in and he paid the price for your failure to keep the law by becoming the curse for us. For it is written in the law, cursed is everyone who hung on a tree. You see, he was the sinless son of God who said, I'll take Dennis's place on the cross. That's where we left off last week. That's where we left off last week. All right. God made him to be sin, okay, for us, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Therefore, he says in, in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. I died. I no longer live. But the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. He redeemed me. He took the curse. He took my place. So when he died, I died. My, my curse was taken by Jesus. And so I get eternal life from him. He redeemed me. He paid the price that I owed, the debt that I had to pay. And so he says he redeemed us in order that the blessings. You see, when I took the book in, cashed in the book, when I believed in Jesus, he gave me the product, the good, because Jesus paid the price. I received the blessing given to Abraham that it might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith, when the moment I received Jesus, I received the promise of the Spirit. Isn't this awesome? You've got to know the difference between the cursing and the blessing. You see, you've got to know the difference between the cursing and the promise. You keep the law, you get cursed. You trust in Jesus, you receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. Oh, my goodness. So I ask myself, what do we take away from the passage today? Oh, there's so much in this passage. What do I take away? The first thing I take away is don't be fooled. Don't be a foolish Galatian trying to do something for the blessing of God. Trying to earn it, trying to keep rules, regulations, keep the Ten Commandments, the, the, the golden rule, do all these wonderful things. But he says, instead, consider those who have gone before us and what they said. It's not by your human achievement. Jesus did everything you need. Trust Jesus. Trust Jesus. Rely on faith, not on the law. Rely on Jesus not on Moses. It's all summed up in one verse, I think. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, I think sorry, in two verses, right here it says, for it is by grace, a free gift, that you have been saved. It was through faith. You access salvation through faith because it's a gift from God, you receive the gift by reaching out with faith and you accept the gift from God. He says, it's not of or from yourself. You can't do it. There is no law, no rule, no, no standard that you can achieve to earn it. It is the gift of God. It's grace. Salvation is all of grace. And just in case you didn't get it, it's not by works. You can't do anything to earn it. Because if you could, you go around patting yourself on the back. Man, am I a wonderful person. Look what I did and what you didn't do. I have Jesus because look what I did and what you didn't do. No, every bit of it, every bit of it is God's grace to you. I didn't realize this. Eight years old, I bowed and prayed and asked Jesus in a child's terms, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ invaded me. 
I became a child of God. I didn't know all these other things. I started pursuing my Christian faith immediately. I bought a Bible. I started reading. I was praying. I went back to church later and told my pastor I need to be baptized. And I was going through, doing all the things because he changed me from a caterpillar to a butterfly. The change is even more radical for people who, are, who lived longer in life and experienced more of the downside of life, the dark side. And they come to Jesus and their lives are radically changed. It's not because you kept rules. God graced you. God graced you. This is amazing grace. And it's offered to you today. You can have God's amazing grace bring you salvation even today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, someone here is saying, I need that change from the inside out. I am the fool. I've been bewitched. I've been enamored by the world and everything in it, and it has deceived me and tricked me. And I know that I am a sinner and I need Jesus as my Savior. So I call upon you, Lord, be my Savior. Save me. Change me from the inside out. Transform my life. Regenerate me. Make me a new person. Father, I know if anyone believes in the Lord Jesus Christ with all their heart, that, that you raised Jesus from the dead after paying the price for your sins, that they will be saved. They will experience and taste of the grace of God. And it will change them from the inside out. That's what you do. That's what your grace is all about. It's so amazing. Thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace. In Jesus' name I pray.